Welcome. It's nice to have you here today at um, today's Strategic Farming Let's Talk Crops program. My name is Angie Peltier. I work up in the Crookston Regional Extension Office. And we're happy to have you join us here today for our session, Making Every Acre Pay. The sessions are brought to you obviously by University of Minnesota Extension, and we have generous support both from the uh, Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council and the Minnesota Corn Growers Research and Promotion Council. I'm gonna introduce our, our three panelists, and then we're going to go into a little bit of the housekeeping for today's webinar. We have three panelists today. We have Naeem Kalwar. He works for NDSU Extension as a soil health specialist at the Langdon Research Extension Center in Northeast North Dakota. For more than 20 years now, he has worked helping crop producers remediate and successfully farm challenging soils in both his native Pakistan and North Dakota. So we're happy to have Naeem with us here today. Tanner Bruce was born and raised in Worthington, Minnesota. So a native um, Minnesotan. He now works in Marshall, Minnesota. He works for both Pheasants Forever and Quails Forever as their Minnesota Ag and Conservation Programs Manager. So we're happy to have Tanner with us here today as well. And then, um, we also have Alan Lepp. He is the Minnesota Assistant State Conservationist for NRCS. He's a native Minnesotan from the Iron Range, and he works out of their Detroit Lakes office right now. So just a few housekeeping things before we get started. These sessions are meant to be more of a discussion type format. We will have about 10 minutes of information presented by our speakers today on this general topic, and then we will open things up for questions you might have. The discussion will focus on questions we received from everyone at registration, but also please enter any questions you might have into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can enter questions at any time during this session. If you're not familiar with Zoom, if you hover your mouse near the bottom of your screen, you should get a toolbar to appear. On this bar, there should be a list of options that includes a Q&A box. You may need to exit full screen for this to appear. There is also a chat box. Um, we'd like you to reserve that chat box for technical issues. Each session is being recorded and will be posted at a later date on our website. And um, with that little introduction, I will turn it over to Naeem Kelwar who will share his screen and PowerPoint presentation with us to get our discussion started today. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, so I'm just gonna recap what um, I consider the major or key soil health issues they are, which are causing um, significant economic losses, not just in North Dakota, but on the Minnesota side as well. So I'm gonna share this slide with you. There are some soil health issues which I consider very important, like for example, loss of topsoil, decreasing organic matter levels, and soil pH could be a big issue, but these are slightly long-term, much more long-term than compared to say the issues of soil salinity, sodicity, and higher magnesium levels compared to calcium and excess soil water. Um, so my focus would be on the issues in the red, but I still wanted to highlight the other three because uh, if we keep losing our topsoil, keep, you know, um, depleting our organic matter levels, or if the pH is not in balance, then we will have severe soil productivity issues. So just to quickly differentiate, because these two issues are often confused together, mixed together, um, especially sodicity issue. Salinity, we see the white salt crust at the surface, um, and we understand, okay, we have a problem, but the sodicity is often... Uh, not um, properly understood. Uh, so salinity is caused by excess levels of water soluble salts and salts are a combination of chemical ions. Uh, in this case, table salt, for example, sodium and chloride, they attract each other with their, with their positive and negative charges. Sodicity is not caused by sodium, which is present as a salt. 
because as a salt, sodium would be attracted to a negatively charged ion like chloride, sulfate, carbonate, bicarbonate, but instead it's attracted to the negative charges of soil, clay, and humus. Sand and silt doesn't have any negative charges. So sodium, which is not present as a salt, but it's in excess, causes sodicity. That's the major difference. So for example, we look at this picture and like this producer, um, everybody would be puzzled. Um, beautiful field, uh, but in between we had these barren spots where our seed germinated, but the seedlings died a little bit after germinating. Sometimes weeds grow, sometimes even we weeds do not grow. Um, and we don't even see the white cell crust here, right here at the surface. So the question which comes to our minds, and then it came to my mind too, what is going on here? Is this only salinity or is there sodicity too, or they're both? Now, um, you know, I would confess to you that personally speaking, the only reason I have a rough idea that bo these both are going on there because I've been taking samples from these kind of spots for over nine years and I've consistently been looking at the results and that's how I know. So the bottom line is when we see these kind of spots, the best approach should be to take soil sample and get them analyzed. That's the best way to assess these issues. Now, what does salinity does or the excess soil soluble salts do? Um, what kind of a negative effect they create. So excess soluble salts directly affect plants. So they compete with plant roots for water. And if there would be high levels of salts in the soil, they would try to keep the water in the soil and plant, plant roots will not have enough pull to get those water molecules in their roots. So result would be drought distressed plants, even though soil moisture levels would be decent. So salts affect plants directly, and then sodicity affects actually soils. The sodicity doesn't affect the plants directly, but it's kind of like actually a much more complex issue even compared to salinity. By virtue of uh, creating these relationship uh, with clay and humus, sodium detaches clay and humus particles from the soil aggregates and the size of the aggregates keep getting smaller. And, um, to a point where the soil layers get very dense and the porous space gets plugged or shrinks. Uh, and this process is called dispersion. And you could see that that will slow down the soil water infiltration as well. And that would actually make the salt issue worse because salts have to go into the deeper depths with the rain water. If you if uh, have irrigated fields, you could use irrigation, good quality irrigation water to leach the salts into the deeper depths, but you'll run into the same problem if you have poor soil water infiltration. The first step for managing these issues is um, to take soil samples. So we have to create zones first. It's grid sampling doesn't work good for these kind of uh, problems because they are not uniform. I've seen some fields where it's only, you know, one problem for 20, 40, 60 acres, but that's rare. Mostly you will find these spots um, in different zones and there will be good crop growing around them and then there will be another spot. So we need to create zones based on the severity of the issue. That means, for example, some spots may support marginal stands of annual crops. Some spots may not support any annual crop growth, but they may support some weed growth like kochia, well, foxtail barley, but some spots will not support anything. So we should not mix soil from these different zones. And then cropping history and landscape. For example, if you're taking a sample from a top of a hill, don't mix it with the low area. And then go three to four feet deep in 12 inch increments. Uh, why we wanna go deep because for fertility, we go zero to six, six to 24 inch, um, because most plant nutrients are in the first uh, six inches. Salts and sodium, that's a different uh, problem. They can go up and down quite a bit uh, with water. And then the basic test for salinity is electrical conductivity or EC. And then um, sodicity is the test or uh, for sodicity, the test is sodium adsorption ratio or SAR and pH. And the method um, which 
will give you the results which are very close to the field conditions, a saturated paste extract method. If you need to know, um, like if there is a need for amendments and if you want to know, uh, you know, you want to apply the amendments such as gypsum and what should be the quantity, then we also need to analyze uh, only the first 12 inches for cation exchange capacity or CEC by sodium saturation method. So uh, it's not just good enough to take the samples and send them to lab. We have to communicate to the lab what kind of a test we want from the lab and what kind of a method uh, labs should use to um, an analyze um, those soil properties. So just to give you a rough example here, I created zones. So for example, if you look at the red triangle, if you're curious about what's going on in that white area, then you should not mix soil from gray area and mix it with the white area because you're gonna get an average. And I mostly keep buckets to separate the depths. You could use Ziploc bags or whatever you want. If there is a need for amendment, and I wanna clarify this, we do not need amendments for salts or salinity issue. We only need amendments if there is a sodium or sodicity issue. And sodium, that sodium is not present as a salt. And that will not happen if the sodium levels are not higher than calcium. So that means you will have to add calcium to the soil. For example, agriculture grade gypsum is calcium sulfate with two molecules of water. So when you spread it, incorporate it into the soil, powder farm is better because it works better with uh, and quicker with uh, soil clay particles. Calcium will separate from sulfate with the help of rain. So this, this is where the weather also plays a huge role because if you incorporate your amendments, but if the weather stays dry, we are not gonna get faster and quicker results from these amendments. And slowly that calcium will displace sodium from the soil particle negative charges and it starts promoting flocculation or aggregation, chemical aggregation of soil particles, which is the opposite of the dispersion caused by sodicity. And then sodium will con convert it to a salt in the soil water and now we could leach it. But again, weather plays an important role because if we don't have enough rainwater to force these salts into the deeper depths, we'll still be fighting these issues. Same concept for the magnesium. A lot of people do not consider that as an issue, but to me, magnesium causes excessive swelling of the soils. Sodium causes excessive dispersion of the soils or the breakdown of aggregates. Both issues result in poor soil water infiltration. Same issue. Um, so magnesium, levels, if they are higher than calcium, that issue, if that happens, we'll have to kind of like answer is to add more calcium to the soil. And we could use the same kind of amendments. Number second things, we have some options to establish on these saline areas. Um, the best option is uh, barley and oats. Um, we, we did a trial in 2020, where we planted four barley and four oat varieties on three different levels of salinity and sodicity. Uh, so here, the surface EC was 3.99 and surface um, SAR was 7.12, so low to moderate. And But the 6 to 24 inch depth had higher EC and SAR levels. And the way these plants were surviving, they were keeping their roots shallow in the first six inches. If you cannot get these two um, crops going. The next option for is to go for perennial salt tolerant grasses. Not all perennial grasses are salt tolerant, but some are. And we could give you that information. And in this picture, you could see that grasses are growing everywhere. Uh, farmer mixed a little bit of alfalfa seed, which started establishing three years after planting um, grasses and alfalfa in it. So grass is kind of like nurtured alfalfa. Quick breakdown of economics. If our um, crop rotation is canola, spring wheat, soybean, and corn, in four years, we are gonna spend a little bit over um, $500 per acre in four years. And that would be a net loss. But if we planted the perennial salt on grasses with one pound of alfalfa in it, a spread herbicide, and if we only mowed the grasses, even then, we'll be saving over $350 per acre in four years and we'll be helping the land. I mean, uh, when we talk about managing um, 
these issues, we have to look at the landscape. Um, you know, most often these spots uh, develop around the headlands because the roads have uh, disturbed or disrupted the natural hydrology of the landscape. So in this picture, there's a 17 inch drop, 17 feet, sorry, drop from south to north, but the access water cannot move because of the highway plus the roadside ditch also doesn't flow well. So what we need to do on these headlands is to plant these uh, mix, uh, this mix of perennial salt tolerant grasses. Um, I personally like these five grasses and we could again uh, give you the mix. Some of the grass roots can go five to six feet deep in, in uh, three to four years if either we mow the grasses, hay or graze them. So the way it works from the higher productive spots or ground, access water first come to the roadside ditch or the highway, it cannot go on the other side. It is stays there, that's free gravitational water. And then the capillary water comes into action which moves from wet to dry area. So the higher ground gets drier, but the headland or the ditch is still wet and this water starts waking up. And this water is not intercepted by tiles, but the plant roots can intercept it. So that's that's what we need to do along these headlands or infield ditches or even around the wetlands. And last point I want to make, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on tiling, but we got to understand that tiles are two and a half to four feet below the surface. If those layers on, sitting on top, soil layers sitting on top of the tiles do not infiltrate water uh, timely, we are not going to get good drainage. Um, so it's not the fault of tiles, it's just soil chemistry. With that, I'll, um, I along with Tanner and Alan will take any questions if there are. So thank you for your presentation, Naeem. Um, you've kind of covered all of this, but I think it would be great to get everybody's perspective um, on, on this particular, <clears throat> excuse me, this particular issue. So um, what I'd like you to do um, is, is address this issue from each of your perspectives. So um, farms where I work in Northwest West Minnesota often have those headlands or areas that run adjacent to road dishes where nothing grows. And these areas appear to be growing in size over time. Um, <clears throat> when you address this name, maybe you can mention how, how and why they might be growing in size over time. But suspecting that this is an issue related to salts, could you each please tell us how you would approach understanding what's actually happening or what could be done for remediation and maybe some of the, the um, farm bill programs that are, are geared towards helping this sort of, sort of situation. And I'll let you um, decide who wants to go first answering. Tanner, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, you know, as you start talking about these different spots, Angie, um, there's a lot of different metrics in, in agriculture today that can help guide you and, and get you to decision-making. Uh, one of the things that, that we've been working on recently uh, would be kind of precision ag and conservation um, and utilizing yield data <clears throat> as applied, as planted, and budgets to kind of look at it more at a subfield level and look at profitability. Um, you know, the more data that you have, the more information you have, the better once you start diving into these areas of the field. And that really opens up a, a new lens as, and perspective as far as the different opportunities that you could use for, for remediation on these acres. Uh, if they're chronically underperforming, uh, what are the other options that we could do with a, a landowner and farmer goals first and profitability second? Um, and kind of what's in your area for, for opportunities? Is it something where, you know, some sort of forage would, would be the best option or, or opportunity for you? Do you have livestock? Um, and, you know, from there, once you, once you implement practices, uh, then it really comes back to the ground truth thing and, and figuring out if, if what we did worked and if what we did uh, made the operation more profitable. Uh, you know, there's different metrics that you can go through agronomically, conservation programs and practices. Uh, so I'll kind of let Naheem talk more on the agronomic and soil side, and, and I'll leave it up to Alan to talk a little bit more about programs and opportunities. So Naeem, would you please um, address how and why those 
those um, unproductive areas in the headlands um, tend to grow over time and how you would start to address what, um, as you pull up to the farmstead and you see these areas, what your, your process is for addressing what's going on there. So we looked at that uh, Google Earth picture and then picture of that headland. So if we look at the recent wet cycle, first it resulted in shallow groundwater depths. Our soils inherently have high levels of salts and, and in some spots, excessive sodium, say versus calcium. In some spots, excessive magnesium, say compared to calcium. And due to weathering, those minerals or salts are there. Water is the carrier. So the shallow groundwater depth or the wet weather brought everything close to the topsoil. Recently, we have been drier, but again, there is this capillary water which wicks up and it could wick up in any direction. The, the, the forces which moves it, it moves from wet to dry area. So I mentioned that we have disrupted the natural hydrology of the landscape. Now we cannot go back in the old age and remove these roads and do whatever. We could improve the drainage by kind of a like recalibrating where the culverts go, but it's still, you know, we could also clean the ditches. So we could try to improve the surface drainage as much as we can. But what is happening? Your headlands are acting like ditches actually. A lot of spots I, have, I see the water level in the ditch and the headlands is roughly the same. So when we say we are drier, well, these areas are not really dry. The groundwater is just sitting there and our soils have lots of salts and sodium with it. So say if you have sloping headlands is slightly lower and then your higher productive ground, then it rains, excess water moves through either runoff or subsurface and it goes and it wants to find the lower spot to go there. Well, when it hits the highway or the ditch, you saw roughly half a mile of distance, 17 feet drop, but the water just sits there because that, that highway has compacted or disrupted that hydrology. So water just sits there. Ditch is not clean either. It doesn't flow good either. And then this higher ground gets um, dry. Now capillary water comes into action. And we have seen actually flat land in, you know, increase in salts in flatland on tiled ground because of the capillary water. So this water keeps moving up and up and with every movement, it brings more salts. And then on top of it, what we are planting is not growing well there. That means there's excess evaporation. That means more waking up of water. That means more salts. And the time, honestly, I would say that there would hardly be a, headland where any annual crop will survive. And to me, these perennials provide such a good opportunity. First of all, they will grow where your most salt tolerant annual crops will not grow. Second thing, you don't need to replant. That means you're not gonna spend money on a seed. You're not gonna be worried about getting the, these grasses planted in the spring when everything is wet. It will provide you better traffic ability it will reduce the evaporation. It will intercept that water before it would wick up. So a lot of people may say, okay, you know, um, why should I sacrifice that land? You know, I'm taking it out of my annual crop. My question is how much, what kind of a yield you're getting from these spots? You're actually losing money by taking advantage of the programs Tanner and Ellen are talking about. You could actually earn some money. If you have livestock, you could get you know, fair to good quality hay if you cut these grasses, you know, at the right time. So you'll earn money and you're going to be helping your land. Plus, if you have a 25 to 30 feet wide strip, that's your cheap insurance to keep your other ground, you know, getting too saline or sodic for the annual crop. The only thing I will add that even though I have said that most of these headlands are, you know, not really uh, suitable for any annual crop, please get them soil tested for ECSAR and, and pH and sh show those results. So somebody, you know, like working for your agronomist or crop consultant, whoever who could give you good advice, just to make sure if there is a potential for planting something salt tolerant, annual crop. 
If there's none, we could give you this grass mix. So I personally think it's a win-win situation for the land as well as for our pocketbooks. Thank you for that explanation. Alan, um, there's probably specific farm bill programs that could help people to establish um, you know, something different in those headlands. Would you mind discussing those? Yeah, absolutely, Andy. Thanks. Uh, Naeem and, and Tanner nailed it and kind of led right into it. So uh, NRCS is a technical agency founded on, you know, science-based technical assistance to the landowner, and that's where we always start. So on the farm, working with the, the farmer or rancher, um, you know, the, the main thing, and we work in conjunction with partner agencies, U of M, NDSU as well for the data. And most producers now have a pretty good uh, source of data themselves with yield maps and whatnot. So, and we also work hand in hand with their agronomists. So really being on the farm, addressing the resource concerns, uh, seeing what's out there. And this specific uh, scenario would be, you know, salinity on the headland issues. So absolutely we have farm build programs available to help. Um, the, the main one we would use is an environmental quality incentives program, EQIP, um, you know, where we can come in like Naeem talked about, plant perennial cover. And, and that could be a, depending on the operation, if you do have cattle or, um, you know, just wanna hay it, um, you know, that's an option. Haying and grazing is, is allowed on most practices um, that we could do. Um, like I said, we don't have to either plant the whole field. If it's spots, headlands, we could do a 30 foot um, strip on the headlands. Um, we could plant the whole field if it's spotty and you want something five years of perennial cover and we could even convert that to uh, pasture as well. So the other option, you know, CRP could be an option as well. Um, again, that'd be a 10 to 15 year contract administered through Farm Service Agency. Uh, we do the technical planning on it, but uh, there's some different options out there. Um, I'll leave it at that. We can get in deeper if you want, but we certainly have options. But the first step is, you know, our our technical staff on the on the farm with the producer to address those concerns and come up with a solution. Thank you. Um, we do have several questions in the Q and A box. If anybody has additional questions or something's been stimulated because of our discussion here, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A box. We're getting right up to 9 a.m., but um, because there are so many questions, I think we're gonna, we're gonna keep on going for a bit. So here's a question, I believe, um, in regards to Naeem's presentation. So Bill asks, can you discuss what precipitation levels where the headland salinity issues are of concern and how does this change as you move east? My view, so I'll give you an example of, say, Langdon area. 16, 2016, um, we have this uh, network of weather stations, Endon, we call them. Um, so our Endon station, it only re record, records um, um, rain from April to October, 25 inches. And this doesn't include the snow data or other things. 17, 10.24. Okay, so you see the drastic difference, but these lowest spots is still were wet. These headlands were still wet. So it's not uh, just about how much quantity of rain we get. So for example, one question can come to my mind too, how much rain is sufficient for crop growth and salt leaching? Well, if we, so our Langdon's normal um, going between 25 and 10, I would say 17 and 18 inches. But if we get two inches in two hours, that's not gonna benefit anything. If we get half an inch or more after a week, week and a half, that would help crops as well as will leach salts. Problem with these lowest spots is that water just sits there for a long time. And it, it actually doesn't really ha have a way out, except you know when it evaporates to the air. That's why I would not put too much emphasis on the rain numbers. You have to look at the land escape. You have to provide escape to that water. And you may not have any 
escape. That may be the lowest point in that area and you cannot really drain it. Even if you pump it, there, there it's gonna go. It may come back because of the gravitational forces. So I would say that the best thing you could do, you should have this buffer. If I would be the landowner, I would have this buffer in the dry as well as wet ears. It will have its benefits um, in, in both type of uh, weather conditions. So I do not have an answer for you in terms of what kind of a rain number will cause this, but I would say that I, I would not put too much emphasis on that because these are headlands mostly, um, either they are the lowest spots or they are just sitting right next to a big ditch. And that, that ditch is waking up water, which is making it, unless you then improve the flow of that ditch to go somewhere else, you will hardly be able to remediate that headland. So Anissa or Anissa asks, for calcium and magnesium, is there a ratio that is used to target and she says calcium is needed in higher quantities, I believe, but just wondering on what ratio of calcium to magnesium would be a good target if, um, if sodicity is your issue. So very good question. I, when I, I compare the results from the problem spots, toughest spots, and then I have taken soil samples from good spots. And I think I showed that slide during our webinar series. What I have learned that in the areas where you do not have any sodicity issue or dispersion or swelling issue, calcium was always at least two and a half times more than magnesium and even four, five, six times higher than sodium. Then you're not going to fight those issues. I'm not saying this is set in the stone, but this is what I've observed um, along with say EC2, even though the question wasn't about salts, but like in a good soil, your saturated paste EC shouldn't be more than, it should be less than 0.8 decisimons per meter or millimoles per centimeter, which are equal. And these are the units. Some, some lab like Agwise uses millimoles per centimeter. The scientific community uses decisimons per meter, but they are the same. As long as you have ECs of less than 0.6 or 0.8, and then your calcium levels are two to three times more than magnesium and four to five times uh, more than uh, sodium, I personally would be very satisfied. You will not have any dispersion or swelling issues. I wanna clarify, there, there is some natural dispersion too. There is some natural swelling too, especially the, you know, the soils we are talking about, the clay is shrinking and expanding. What I am talking about, the chemically induced, excessive swelling or dispersion. You will not fight those. Doug asks, what is the payment to take headlands out of production? So I think that one goes yeah. to Alan. Yeah, Do you know it uh, offhand, Alan? Tanner is virtually uh, staring at me, I can tell. I don't <laughs> have it in front of me. And you know, there's a few different answers to that question, depending on, on which route you'd want to go. Um, you know, just one practice we could use would be a what we call a field border like i said minimum 30 foot strip um that i'm gonna it's roughly around 300 dollars an acre if it's currently cropland that uh you know provides for the seeding of that and then some foregone income from uh you know taking that out of production so yeah roughly around 300 um again and then you know, CRP doesn't have a, an option specifically for, for headlands, but depending on eligibility and practice and where you are in the state, um, you know, each county has a different rate. And of course, then that's for 10 years. The 300 I'm talking about is in, through EQIP. Um, that'd be a one-time payment. Thank you. Um, so Steve asks, do some of these remediation ideas work for sandy soils? Yes, they will work. So sandy soils will have better infiltration compared to say clay or even silt. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you may not have a salinity or sodicity issue. If you're fighting those issues, but you will have a, slight, a slighter edge compared to 
uh, when you're fighting these issues on heavy clays, for example, because you will have better infiltration. So yes, they will work. And, and we have seen these problems in the sandy areas too. So the same concepts will work, but I would say that you may have a, depending upon again, the weather, how much rain we get, if you have dry weather, even though you may have good infiltration, but there would be nothing uh, to infiltrate. Uh, but yes, the same concepts will work. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, kind of, if we start talking about salinity, we can compare that to sandy soils. We can compare that to, you know, prairie potholes and, and wet soils as well. And just kind of boiling it down to trouble areas, if you will, um, that, you know, I don't know what the ratio is, you know, five out of six years, it, it does not grow a crop. Um, and that's kind of where I guess I'll go back to precision data and the different technologies that are out there today. Um, and the opportunity then to, to dive into these subfield areas and, and figure out some other land use, uh, you know, grow another crop, if you will, whether that's forage or, or just something else. Um, and, you know, what we see from that is increased profitability, increased return on investment, um, increased APH. So over time, uh, you're going to start to increase your whole field uh, average, which uh, will have long lasting benefits moving into the future. Um, and then you're also, you know, doing different things that are increasing soil health and, and other metrics as well, uh, while decreasing risks and, and input costs, uh, decreasing your break even. Um, and I don't know if farmability is a word, uh, but, you know, just kind of getting rid of some of these trouble areas. Um, and what I want to emphasize in addition to that is, you know, once you start making changes on these subfield acres, some subfield areas, you can then take the working capital that you were pumping into those acres, start reallocating them over the rest of your farm and start throwing in other metrics to uh, really take those acres and, and increase your productivity on those as well. So kind of taking a, a whole operation or, or whole field look at it, so. Um, so we have a, a guest today from Indonesia, uh, Rusty. Um, and, and the question that they ask is, how about using organic matter to solve sodicity? Um, will that work? Yes. So one of the regrets I have, so we have a tiling project here. So when we were designing it, I wanted big plots. So we had four treatments, three replications, just to have the statistical analysis. Um, and one of the regrets I have that I couldn't add a fifth treatment to each replication to add a manure treatment. So if you, very good question. Here's, here's the concept you think about. What was the name again, uh, Angie? Roosty. Roosty. So Roosty, here's, think about this. What is sodicity is doing? Sodicity is breaking down soil aggregates to make the size of the aggregates very small to make the soil layers dense. What manure would do, you, you're talking about organic matter, but in order to increase organic matter, you will have to either add some sort of livestock or animal manure. You have to either plant a cover crop to leave more biomass, or in the old days, they used to plant green manure crop and then used to till them in. So this is how you increase your organic matter levels. So when you induce, you add manure, or when you leave more crop biomass, you induce more microbial activity. When those microbes break down, whether it's crop biomass or the livestock manure, they release a lot of um, acids, which balance the pH, plus they also release a substance which is called glumelin, for example. So glumelin binds soil particles together. So that's um, chemical, oh, sorry, biological aggregation of soil particle. Calcium does the chemical aggregation of soil particles. So yes, um, increasing soil organic matter will help soil fight these issues. Actually, it will help you with salinity too. So for salts, they have to go down. More organic matter levels means you have less compaction and you will have more pore space, your soil would be fluffy. Under the wet weather, you could get rid of the excess water. And I'm not being, I've not been to Indonesia, but I've been to Thailand. 
my sister actually just recently completed her PhD from Indonesia. And I'm, I like to think that you guys get a lot of rain there. That means you need good infiltration. You may have very good natural hydrology too. I don't know about that. But under the drier weather, when your soils need to preserve more moisture, that organic matter will help you. So organic matter, to me, it will never go wrong. And especially when it comes to sodicity or even the access magnesium levels compared to calcium, it will help you fight those issues. So uh, another question, this one is from an anonymous attendee. So name, if, if somebody uh, collects soil samples and sends them into, for example, the NDSU soil um, lab or um, egg vice, for example, when you send in your sample, does it provide um, back when you get your results recommendations for um, how much calcium sulfate to apply? I guess they could, but then uh, here's the other thing. So when you send the samples to AgWise or any lab for that matter, University of Minnesota lab or uh, say NDSU soil testing lab, um, you have to tell them, for example, this is why the slide I showed you, ECSARPH through saturated paste method, CEC, um, only for the zero to 12 inch depth through sodium saturation method. So you say, for example, did that. Labs can provide you recommendations too. I know that AgWise provides fertility recommendations. And when it comes to gypsum um, you know, recommendations, I'm pretty sure that they could, I mean, these are simple formulas. Well, I, when I, when I say simple, they're not that simple when you wanna enter them in Excel, but they, they, they have the formulas. These are not just like something which is earth shattering. You know, There are two main formulas to calculate the rates of the amendments and it all starts from gypsum. So you start with 100% pure gypsum. And then if there is, 80% pure gypsum, then you, there's a formula to compensate for the lack of purity. And then some amendments, for example, elemental sulfur, then you go, say, if you want to apply one ton of 100% pure gypsum, then you apply 0.19 ton of 100% pure elemental sulfur. And then some amendments, you apply 65% of your gypsum recommendation. So yes, labs can give you that. We could help you that. Uh, NDSU, actually, Tom D. Sutter has a gypsum app. Um, too. So you could use that too. Um, there are two main formulas. One is USDA formula and one is uh, oyster formula. And it's called because uh, the scientist's last name is oyster. Very good formula. The only, my, the reason I still like the USDA formula because it um, only takes into account CEC and uh, SAR or exchangeable sodium percent. There is the oyster formula I ask you for um, bulk density data. Well, bulk density sampling is very complex and most farmers do not have that data. So then it assumes bulk density. I like to take assumptions out as much as possible, but the long answer, uh, the bottom line is labs can do that for you. We could do that for you, no problem. So Tanner, you, you had a, a during our our webinar series, and I'm going to share with people in the chat um, the, the URL so you can actually find those on YouTube online. It's a, a playlist where there's going to be three different um, webinars. They're each about an hour long, but they go into greater detail about each of these um, gentlemen's work. But, but Tanner, you provided during those webinars um, just some examples of what people have done. And I know you say that the, the first step is, is to um, speak with the farmers, visit the farm, try to figure out what their conservation goals are um, for those unproductive acres. And then there's a couple of different routes they could take. So, so some people might decide not to make a change. Um, some might decide to talk to Alan and his colleagues and, and maybe enroll some of those tough acres in a farm bill conservation program, or um, other folks might decide to make a change without enrolling in a farm bill program. Do you know um, offhand just generalized uh, information, not looking for specific numbers, just offhand, 
how many people go each route that you've work in, worked with over the years? Uh, that'd be pretty variable. Um, obviously, the different programs and the financial incentives to it are definitely intriguing because you can really start to plug numbers in that way and start offsetting costs and, and kind of figuring out that profitability and return on investment. Um, but with that, you're entering a program that there will be some, some restrictions to it, right? And there is a contract and, and you got to you know, follow some of those, those different metrics. Uh, and there's a lot of individuals that at the same time, you know, they just want to do something and try it for a year or two and not get locked into a five-year, 10-year, 15-year contract. Um, oftentimes I guess we would say, you know, if they either that operation has livestock or they have surrounding neighbors that have livestock, um, a lot of that usually is going, you know, not through a program just because of that added benefit and, and the forage that they can produce to open up those opportunities. Uh, we've had individuals that have, um, actually taken some, some red acres in their row crop fields and, work through different programs like NRCS and actually extended their pasture uh, to remove those acres and, and provide more forage opportunity for their livestock uh, in the pasture. So in a roundabout way, I maybe didn't answer your question, Angie, um, but it is, it is variable. And, you know, I would say 50, 50, or maybe a little more leaning towards, uh, you know, different program opportunities through, through NRCS or the state or, or whatever it may be, just because it's easier there's a straight line to, you know, kind of the financial offset of that. So I, I just put in the chat box information about how people can access our um, Making Every Acre Pay playlist on the YouTube channel. So please go ahead if you want more information about that. Otherwise, um, I just wanted to ask each of our, our panelists if they have uh just a closing message or something they wanted to share with our, our um, guests before we sign out here for the morning. Yeah, I can start real quick. So, um, you know, like to wrap this all up, what we look at, and again, we work with uh, partner agencies like Pheasants Forever and Soil and Water Districts and the, the state of Minnesota. Um, you know, we really try to tie it all together and tie conservation with productivity. So we're addressing these resource concerns, we're improving, uh, you know, addressing those concerns, improving uh, environmentally sensitive areas at the same time, inc increasing productivity in the producer's bottom line. And, you know, I just want to point out that example we talked about today with headlands or planting perennials, that's certainly not the only option or tool in the toolbox we have with our programs uh, you know we have hundreds of different practices so that was the example we talked about today but there's there's certainly more um our programs are very competitive there's a huge demand in minnesota uh, we don't fund nearly as many as we'd like to or nearly all the applications so uh, my advice is, you know, just get in, talk to our staff, um, get them out on the farm and start working on a plan and going through the options. Thanks. And the, the current year's um, funding decisions are being made right now, correct? And so when can people um, apply next? So, yeah, for, for EQIP, um, our, our first application period Past and we're, we're working on the ranking and things right now and hopefully funding decisions in the next uh, few months here. Um, you can apply anytime. Uh, there's no, we have application cutoffs where we just have to, you know, take them from, from here back and, and go forward, but anytime. Um, and you can contact our staff at any time. So there's no, yeah, there's no limit on when you can apply it, just when you're going to fall into those periods, but all that dates and things are always posted on our website or you can call any of our offices in the county you're located. Thank you. So Tanner, would you like to go next? Yeah, I would just say, you know, there's a lot of people out there uh, looking to, to help you. Obviously, it's, it's your decision and, and voluntary conservation. Um, but you've got, you know, NRCS out there that, that has programs to help. Um, you know, the the university side of things and, and kind of the education portions out there. You got commodity organizations, uh, 
you've got your crop consultants, your agronomists, uh, really just, just take a look at all the different opportunities out there and, and figure out what, what fits your operation the best and, and kind of start thinking about profitability and, and how you can get to where you want to be. Um, for example, we've got farm bill biologists out there that, that can assist with different programs. Uh, we've got a precision ag and conservation specialist that'll work with you and, and help analyze your, your farm and your fields and identify opportunities. Uh, so I just want to stress there's a lot of people out there ready and willing to help. Um, it's, it's your choice. Uh, and, and if you can get, you know, different perspectives out on your farm together and everybody can start talking about it, uh, you can really start looking at agronomic decisions, conservation decisions, and, and uh, making those educate, educated choices and, and land management options. So I think that's about it, Angie, just put a lot of people out there to help. So, so use the different resources out there. Thank you, Tanner. Naeem? So I, I'm just going to say that, you know, when I talk about these issues, I generally tend to create a blank or bleak picture, but I, I want to emphasize that no, there are answers to these problems. So please don't lose your heart, um, you know, but I would say one thing that we got to treat these spots differently. And I've actually heard some producers saying that why should we plant buffer strips you know we're going to be taking our annual crops out of there and i think they don't want to lose their base acres i understand there are some concerns here but i would like to ask them think critically to see how much money you're losing actually every year when you plant these spots you know and what if if you did something different you you know even if there is, you break even, you know, you're still going to be helping the land. This is your land, which you may want to pass on to your kids or grandkids, you know, somebody will need to farm this land, you know. So I personally think that if I would be uh, the landowner, I would go to Alan's office first thing, and I would uh, put these um, spots or to go to Tanner and try to take advantage of these different programs. They're basically, um, they'll pay for the cost of the planting and everything. It'll help the land and it'll give me a little bit of money, but at least I would not lose money. So think, think about doing something different on these spots. If we keep going on and just not shut off of our planters on these spots, they're just gonna keep getting worse. So thank you, Naeem. So as we wrap up here today, I, I just wanted to thank our presenters and thank everybody that um, stuck with us here today for this strategic farming Let's Talk Crops program. There is a very short, and I'll stress short, three question survey when you leave the session. If you could please take a minute to provide feedback on today's session, that would be much appreciated. Know that this information helps us to develop the best programs we can for you. And we also need this information for federal reporting purposes. Again, thank you to our sponsors, the Minnesota Soybean and Corn Research and Promotion Councils. So thank you to both Minnesota Soybean and Corn Research and Promotion Councils. And next week, um, next week's session, same time, same place, will be um, the insects that bug your corn. And so I just wanted to let everybody know that we wish you a very great rest of your day and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.